I'm very happy today to present to you my uh, PhD work entitled Near Infrared Spectroscopy Applied to Solid Organic Waste and How to Avoid Water Effects. So the PhD work was under the direction of Jean-Michel Roger and Jean-Philippe uh, Steyer and co-supervised by Eric Latry, Riyad Bendoula and Cyril Charnier. And so it was a joint uh, research project between two, two member, uh, partners, so INRAE with two institutes, uh, so the Laboratory, Laboratory of uh, Biotechnology for Environment in Narbonne and uh, the ITAP, unit, uh, the Mixed Unit Research ITAP in Montpellier. Um, so this is the agenda I will follow. Um, I will first start with an introduction uh, on the context of this PhD work. Um, present to you my scientific objectives. And then I will present my materials and methods uh, which I've used to uh, answer those scientific objectives. I will go through four main results uh, that I've selected to present to you today and uh, we'll go through conclusions and give some perspectives about the work. So as an introduction, um, the context is on anaerobic uh, co-digestion co process. So we see that we have a variety of uh, inputs, including uh, byways, crop residues, um, urban and industrial effluents, a wide diversity of, uh, of uh, substrates, which can be valorized through the anaerobic digestion process uh, to provide different outputs. So we have uh, the biogas itself, which is uh, mainly uh, made of um, CH4, methane, and the digestate, which is the co-product. And from those outputs, the biogas is uh, usually transformed to, uh, with combined heat power to pr produce uh, both heat and electricity. Uh, and more and more, we have uh, gas rate in injection, so we directly in inject the gas in the gas rate. And we can also convert this biogas into vehicle uh, fuel. And the co-product, the digestate, can be uh, really used as a fertilizer in agriculture. But in this process, we see that uh, those inputs can be very uh, diverse. We have, a, uh, there are very high diverse, both in terms of biochemical uh, properties and physical properties. And more than that, we have some daily fluctuations of the, both in terms of quality and quantity. And so this poses some uh, questions uh, on how to optimize the, the, the process. And um, in particular, how to optimize the feeding recipe, how, in which pro proportions we're going to put those inputs uh, uh, on a daily basis. And we see that it requires, therefore, fast and reliable characterization tools um, in order to characterize those substrates uh, on a daily and continuous uh, basis. So in terms of substrate characterization, um, the main uh, characteristic that is uh, actually today monitored and used to optimize the feeding uh, recipe is the biochemical methane potential, so BMP. Uh, so it consists in taking the organic waste and uh, put it, putting it into um, glass uh, vials uh, with an inoculum. And during 30 to 60 days, we're going to let the anaerobic digestion process uh, go through. And we're going to monitor the gas production during the, the degradation process. And the accumulated volume that we have measured of gas uh, corresponds to the, the maximum uh, uh, volume of gas that can be extracted from a substrate within optimal conditions. But we see that this process is quite uh, long. It takes from 30 to 60 days, depending on the substrate. And so since about 10 years ago, um, the LBO with uh, ETAP and um, also another company called Undalis have developed and propose the news-based uh, characterization tool. And uh, today this is uh, actually used by uh, BioNTech and proposed uh, as a service. So those substrates are uh, prepared. We have a uh, freeze drying and grinding steps. Um, then the, the, the powder that we obtain is uh, analyzed through spectroscopy, near-infrared spectroscopy in reflectance mode. Um, and through chemometrics, um, we are able to predict the methane potential. So that was the results of the first uh, thesis of a PhD uh, by uh, Lester et al. Uh, and then the second PhD actually extended this, uh, this characterization to other characteristics, including uh, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates. And so we see now that now we have a full description of our substrates. So we are able to optimize the feeding recipe. So, uh, but 
unfortunately, well, I, go, I will go through what are the current hurdles. But before the advantages, uh, we see that he has a, a fast measurement, like main, most of the near infrared spectroscopic applications. Uh, instead of uh, one to two months, we do it in four days. Uh, it's applicable on a very highly diverse uh, um, range of, uh, of waste. Uh, it's accurate and uh, reproducible, and it's now possible to optimize the feeding recipe, the strategy. But the hurdles is that in, in this process, what really takes time is the sample preparation. Uh, the, the near infrared spectroscopy is, uh, takes about uh, five to 10 minutes, but it, in fact, the freeze drying and grinding steps take up to four days because we need to send this, the sample to the laboratory and then uh, uh, do the freeze drying. So we have to uh, freeze it, then dry it, and it takes uh, four days. So why do we do that? The sample preparation today is required to avoid the particle, um, si uh, the particle size effects and the water effects. So it's a time-consuming step. And, uh, and one of the, of the drawbacks of this uh, uh, of this technology is that we need to, there's a loss of volatile fraction during the drying. And in fact, in anaerobic digestion process, it's quite uh, important because the volatile fatty acids, for example, can uh, account for a major part of the BMP, the, the potential, uh, yeah, the methane potential. And so it limits uh, the online applications to have a continuous uh, analysis of substrates. So my, in my the question, my operational context is really this one. How can we avoid the uh, freeze drying steps and analyze the fresh matter directly uh, by near infrared spectroscopy? So there are two underlying questions. The first one was, can we find modeling strategies that can account for those moisture uh, content effects? And the second one is, our handheld current uh, portable uh, spectrometers are they, they suitable for characterizing uh, uh, such a diverse uh, city of organic waste and when they are wet? So this part I didn't, uh, I, I decided not to present to you today, but uh, we have worked on this uh, 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 during the PhD work. So in terms of potential applications, uh, what we foresee is uh, online analysis. So we, we have uh, in front of the, in, at the entrance of the digester, we have a, an online analysis of all the feedstock um, or on-site analysis where we have portable spectrometers and people uh, analyzing the different uh, uh, organic waste uh, uh, sources. So to, to answer those, uh, this question and, uh, of how to build a robust model against uh, water effects, the first question that we've asked ourselves was whether we could influence the the, the influencing factor, uh, control the influencing factor. So that's actually what we're doing today. We're uh, freeze drying and grinding. And so we reduce those, uh, the influence of water and particle size. But if we don't want this, then the, one of the second question is whether the measurement method itself uh, can be uh, 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 changed in order to be less influenced by the influencing factor. So when we think of the measurement mode, we have different, uh, when we send light on a substrate, uh, the, depending on where we actually collect the light, we will have different photons with uh, different information. And so the resulting spectra that we measure is going to be, uh, is going, uh, to be more or less influenced by the, the, the water effects. And finally, the last question is whether the modern pipeline itself can be influenced, uh, less influenced by the factor. So that's the whole world of chemometrics and pre-processing models. So my scientific objectives were the following one, to develop a better understanding of uh, moisture content effects on NIRS applied to a wide range of organic materials. And the second objective was to find new ways of building uh, models that are more robust to moisture content effects. So now I will present the, my materials and methods uh, that we've uh, developed to answer those questions. So actually, we, we uh, developed an innovative system that uh, allowed us to collect the spectral variations that were related to uh, uh, water variations. Um, so both to actually uh, evaluate what are the moisture content effects, but also to uh, test some new methods to uh, uh, build models. So it consisted of a closed uh, circuit uh, with an air drying. Uh, it's an air drying system where um, air is actually dried by a desiccant. 
um, and uh, through through the uh, dried air, the sample can be dried along uh, in about two two to three days, depending on the substrate. And along the drying, uh, we actually collected thanks to uh, near infrared, we, we collected the uh, spectra from under the sample. And uh, the desiccant was also weighed in order to evaluate the loss on dry. So the amount of water that was extracted. And so from this, we could actually estimate the, the, the dry matter of the sample with its spectra. So this is the kind of uh, data set that we obtained for one substrate. Uh, so here we can see in blue that we have our wet uh, spectra, which is uh, with the two main OH uh, absorption peaks. Um, and then along, along drying, so from one to three days, uh, we end up with a, a spectra of a dry sample in red. So we did this actually for uh, 89 substrates, uh, covering a really wide range of uh, biochemical and, and, uh, and physical uh, uh, composition. And we obtained uh, more than 120,000 spectra. Uh, and this covered a very wide range of the full range actually of, uh, of dry matter. And in parallel, all of those substrates were freeze-dried and ground with the current process, ESCAN, to obtain the full description of the, our substrates. So just to give you an example of the, the, the complexity of the, this data set and the, the wide range of the physical properties and biochemical composition, we have solids, we have liquids, we have translucent liquids, suspensions, emulsions, it's, it really covers the type of organic waste that is susceptible to, to appear in a, a digestion. So first, our first, um, one of the first uh, tests and study that we did was whether we could actually build a model with this, with this data set. Um, so the, the aim was to evaluate global correction methods that exist today in uh, chemometrics to account for moisture content variations. And so it's the approach one model for all substrates, all uh, dry matter range um, that we evaluated. So we tested this on, for BMP prediction, which is really the main uh, characteristic that, is, uh, uh, that needs to be monitored. So the workflow was the following. We have an original uh, BMP dry model, which worked on freeze dried and ground samples. And then we have our drying experiments uh, with spectra covering uh, different moisture contents. And our aim was to build a BMP wet model, which worked on raw and uh, wet samples. So the methods that we evaluated uh, were the following ones. We have methods that were more on the, the that worked more on the spectra, trying to correct the spectra and reduce the, the, the footprint of water. Uh, and other methods which were more on the model itself, trying to uh, build a new model. And, uh, uh, so the first ones are more on the spectra, so feature selection. The, it's a very simple method where we, we, from knowledge, we know that in some regions of the spectra, we, we absorb uh, uh, water, the OH uh, bands uh, uh, absorb. So we just uh, cut those uh, water bands and try to build them up. The second one was uh, scaling or screwing. Uh, the principle is really to, uh, to downweigh those regions in which we know that uh, the moisture content uh, makes the spectra vary a lot. The second one is quite similar, but it's, uh, it uses an orthogonal projection. So we define, uh, we, we identify the subspace that, uh, of the moisture content variations, and then we project orthogonally to, those, uh, to this subspace in order to, so that our spectra will not be influenced by those uh, variations. And OSCEPO is quite similar, but the, before identifying the subspace, we, we we project orthogonally to what we were going to actually predict in order to, because probably in those moisture content variations, there's, there might be information related to, uh, that could be useful to predict. Uh, we also tested the transfer methods, so piecewise direct standardization, which the principle is you build a model between your wet spectra and uh, your dry spectra, a linear model, and, um, and then you do a model on the dry spectra. So then the methods were more working on the model itself. The, the really easiest approach is the model update. So it's also uh, called the data augmentation. The principle is just to combine the wet spectra and the dry spectra together and try to let the PLS uh, find the, the most uh, best uh, model. 
A similar method is repeatability file, where uh, instead of adding the wet uh, spectra, we add those differences between dry and wet spectra. And we, we say that the, the y, so what we want to predict, equals to zero. And we can also um, uh, weigh the two data sets, the influence of those two data sets. And then we tested stacking, where the principle was to actually stack all those methods together. Those are the predictions that were made by each of those samples. We did a PLS on those predictions to predict uh, uh, the, what we, the BMP. And in, in the hope of really robustifying even more, because we know that each method could have its own bias and, and, um, and uh, performances. So the two data sets we have were the freeze-dry ground samples, so X-dry, that we call X-dry, and the raw samples in the ground ground, x weights. And then we split those sets into train and uh, test sets. So X-dry train, X-dry test, X-wet train, X-wet test. Um, and here is what we obtained for the original model, which means that it's a model that was built only on the dry spectrum. So here it's the results, so predicted versus observed. So what we have in blue is the X-dry train. So then we have the X-dry test. We see that it follows a, a nice, uh, the, the, the identity curve very well, identity line. And now on the X-wet train and X-wet test, so those are the wet spectra, we see that there's no, it doesn't work. Our, our current model, the dry model, doesn't work on wet spectra. So this is what we're going to try to, to remove, to correct. So the RMSCP, if we look um, on the, the, each time on the test sets, so X-dry test and uh, X-wet test, we see that we have a, uh, RMSCP of 65, which is kind of the what we aim to have, we target uh, for BMP prediction. And we have 192 of RMSCP, which is really bad, of course, and uh, doesn't, uh, it's not suitable. So now to the right, I present to you uh, one of the correction methods that we employed, so the repeatability file, I will present the other the, just later. And what we can see is that indeed, in terms of RMCP, we, we uh, were able to, uh, to uh, enhance those uh, performances with a 94 uh, RMCP, which is quite, uh, quite okay in, in a sense. But if we look at the R squared, that's where we see that, in fact, uh, we don't really have a model. Um, on the first one, we see that we have a negative R squared, and, and on the right, with the repeatability file, we see that we only have a R squared of 0 0.15. And so clearly, it's not, there's no model. We can say that there's no model, um, and that uh, it didn't work. So here are the results that we obtained for all the methods. So my original dry model, which was built on the X dry set, here are the performances. We see we have like about 64 uh, of uh, RMCP, and the R squared is about 0 0.7, as we have seen before. On the X weight, we have seen that it's really a bad uh, uh, RMCP. And what we can see for all those methods is that, is that in fact, all the R squared are uh, negative or zero or uh, not above uh, 0 0.2. So, in fact, none of those uh, methods were able to, uh, to correct and account for moisture content effects. So uh, another, another point on this study was that the prediction error really depended on substrates. And so here are the RMCP that were evaluated per substrate. And we see that we really have big differences with a substrate which are up to 175 uh, uh, error and others which are really good uh, under, 0 point, uh, under 0, uh, 40. So what we, what we thought was that it implied different sensitivities to moisture and content effects, depending on the substrate type, and also uh, possibly different types in terms of spectrum, different types of moisture content effects that couldn't be uh, accounted with one global model. So our conclusion was that we needed to better assess moisture content effects according to those uh, substrate types. So this makes me come to the second part um, about no, the non-linearity of uh, water effects. So the objective was really, uh, as I said, to analyze moisture content effects according to substrate type and uh, moisture content level. So to do this, we use the most simple uh, and basic tool uh, of chemometrics, which is principal components analysis. We, the spectra during drying were projected 
into the, the, the PCA uh, components. So we have the scores, which we looked, uh, we looked at the scores uh, depending on both the substrate type and the moisture content level, how they evolved. And of course, we analyze each of those, uh, the loadings of each uh, principal components to better understand what, in terms of spectra, uh, what kind of variations it, uh, it, uh, it represented. So here I, I've decided to present to you the, the within substrate uh, variations, PCA on the within substrate variations, meaning that for each substrate, we center um, the, the block and then we do a PCA on all of those blocks. Uh, so it allows us to really see for one substrate what kind of variations we have during dry. So the, the first loading here is really corresponds to the, the kind of the mean spectra. It's a really a, a general, uh, it, it represents the scattering uh, mostly. Um, and, uh, it, and it explains actually 92% of the variance, which is quite classical in, uh, in near infrared spectra. And most of the information is in fact uh, based uh, dependent of the uh, scattering. Um, and here I present the scores evolutions with moisture content that we obtained. Uh, so what we, we uh, observed was that, so we have the PC1 score and the evolutions with moisture content. And so I've just represented some of the, the substrates. So, uh, and we see that, that for most samples, we have a decreasing spores um, uh, during, uh, during drying. And what we also uh, see is that this, this uh, evolution is nonlinear. We don't have a linear uh, relationship with moisture content, um, which could also explain why we have issues to actually predict moisture content itself. So that was the first uh, learning. The second learning was that, in fact, we see that we have, we, we also have a nonlinearity due to the fact that we have substrates which have opposite evolutions, uh, which are mostly highly fat uh, content uh, substrates, uh, like pork, sour cream, uh, mayonnaise, butter. All those samples actually uh, showed an increased uh, absorption during the uh, time. So we, we then found out those two nonlinearities, and then we looked at, if we looked at the second PCA, uh, the second principal components, and we look at the loadings, we really see those two clear uh, uh, OH absorption uh, bands uh, with this explained variance. And when we look at the scores evolution for, for in this principal component, uh, we, now, we also see that, of course, we also have a decrease of those absorption bands as uh, we dry, we, we have less absorption due to the OH uh, vibrations, and that this evolution is also nonlinear. Um, and but but in fact, we also found out that some substrates, up to a given moisture content over a, a certain moisture content, didn't show up those uh, spectral absorption features. The, the, the in fact. At, at the end of the drying, it indeed showed up a, a, a decrease, but up to a certain moisture content, we have a, a, a flattening of the spectra. Uh, and we interpreted this as being a, 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 an increased pore scattering. There's no more light that comes back to the, or very little light that comes back to the, the detector. And so for all wavelengths, in fact, we can differentiate in terms of absorption uh, the, the, so the conclusions were that, the, as we see, the, the, the water effects are very complex. They, they, have, they mix chemical effects in, uh, related to absorption and physical effects related to the scattering. And this, uh, those effects depend both on substrate type and moisture content level. And we also saw that from here, we, we really, one of the, the learning was about the physical effects that I think we don't really, uh, uh, think about when we think about uh, water effects. We always talk about those OH absorption bands, but there's a, a, a highly uh, a, a big effect just related to the change of scattering due to water. So we wanted to investigate and better understand these effects. So in this uh, study, that's what we're going to try to answer. The, the objective was how does water actually affect the light scattering in the, in the media? Uh, so, and, and to do this, we, we wanted to study independently those scattering effects. So from the chemical effects, because there are some interactions and in order to di differentiate those, we tried to, uh, to find a sample that, uh, where we could 
study independently those effects. So the proposed approach was to find a sample that was a scattering media, a particulate uh, media, with limited uh, chemical interactions, with no solubilization processes or that really uh, add up uh, to nonlinearities, and that we had very limited absorption from the dry mass. And we found this uh, sample, so aluminum simple uh, uh, system consisting of aluminum paper pellets uh, mixed with water. So from under, we still have the, the measurement from under this uh, the, the petri dish. And so to, to really come back to, to understand the, the scattering effects, we have to come back to the principles of, uh, of near infrared spectroscopy. So the Buber, Beer, Lambert uh, uh, law framework. So in transmission measurements, we, we found that, so those three authors uh, found out that the absorbance, which corresponds to minus log of the transmittance, uh, was linearly related to the concentration C. So C is the concentration of the absorbing sample, in our case, water. Uh, and L is the pass length. And so we see that we have this linear relationship. But what we know is that this law, it's, it's like the ideal uh, uh, gas, the uh, perfect gas uh, law. It uh, it's, uh, never really works, but it's a good model to, uh, to build on. Uh, so it holds in very strict conditions, homogeneous and fully transmitting uh, medium, low concentrations, independence of absorbers. If they hide each other, it doesn't work anymore. And uh, the use of monochromatic light. So what, uh, in, so what happens in scattering media? Because we know it, we actually uh, can characterize it with reflectance modes and substrates. So how, how is this dealt? Uh, so the light scattering results in two phenomena. The first one is that we have uh, pass length modifications due to repetitive uh, refraction events. The light actually uh, travels furthermore in the matter. Um, and we also have a photon's loss. Due to scattering, the photons actually never come back to the detector. They, they refract, scatter in the media, and never come back to the detector. And so as a measurement, the absorbance, it's going to be a, a negative effect due to this photon's loss. So in terms of modeling, what was proposed by Martin et al. principally it's at the basis of EMSC preprocessing um, was to actually uh, model those two effects with a multiplicative effect, saying that the path length is actually multiplied by a, a constant k, and an additive effect f, which is uh, really those, it corresponds to the photon's loss. And though by correcting those two effects, we are able to come back to the uh, real absorption that we have, we would have measured in transmittance. So in our case, what we what we proposed was that the moisture content directly influenced the, the scattering. And so we decided that as there's less moisture content, we know that there's going to be more uh, uh, photons coming back to the detector. And this relationship is actually directly related to moisture content. So we proposed, it was really the, the, the intuition that water acts as a guide for photons. Um, and that uh, and, and this, this, uh, this relationship actually involved more like a, a geometrical or volumetric uh, relationship. And so that's why we proposed a, a, a hypothesis, which, which was that the light path length was, could be directly related to moisture content, uh, thanks to a, a power law. Uh, so we have here L lambda the C, which is equals to L zero times the concentration in water up to a power. Um, and so this is the, the final uh, law that we proposed here with still those additive effects which needed to be accounted for. So to, to validate this law on our uh, simple uh, model system, we needed to remove those additive effects. And to do this, we used the EMSC extended uh, multiplicative scatter correction uh, uh, framework, uh, where we only removed those, the additive effect. We didn't remove the multiplicative effect. And, and then we, once we had this uh, absorbance minus those additive effects, uh, we did the log log least squares regression to uh, validate the fact that we indeed had uh, this relationship. So here are the, the spectra that we obtained measured for, uh, for the aluminum paper pellets during drying. And we see that we have some differences between spectra, which are simple baselines, and those are consist of the additive effects. And when we correct the spectra, we re really remove those uh, differences, it's more uh, stable. And also we remove the footprint, the signature of aluminum, our system aluminum paper pellets, which 
has a, a, a given uh, baseline, an initial given baseline. So we looked at for one wavelength uh, what kind of evolutions we had. So this is the raw absorbance at one wavelength at uh, 1,450 nanometers. So we see we have those differences in the, from each point for one given water content. Then with the corrected absorbance, we see that we, we smoothed in fact, those, uh, those differences, we remove the, those additive effects. And finally, when we go, we do a log-log plot. Uh, so the log of our corrected absorbance with the log of water content, we see that we have a very good fit of 0 0.995. And this is interesting because now from the, the slope and the, uh, the, the intercept, we're able to evaluate uh, what is our power of, power and what is our, the extinction coefficients if we really want to do the a spectroscopic study of the, the sample. So then we, so this was for one wavelength, we then applied it for all wavelengths, it depends on each wavelength uh, from 1000 to 2500. And we obtained for most of the wavelengths, so up to, uh, over 1350 nanometers, a very good uh, R squared. And uh, we actually, in fact, had stable, if we look at the slope value, so the power, it's, uh, it was very uh, stable uh, at uh, 1.5. So this further validates the power law. And what's interesting is that we, we now better understand why uh, even building a, a simple moisture content uh, prediction model uh, for a wide range of, uh, of moisture content is actually not uh, suitable. So the PLS eventually, uh, uh, can evaluate this power law, but it's it's uh, it's linear, so there's no uh, it's an approximation which could work, but not it's it's not the best. So we tried to to investigate a bit this the, the what were the implications on those uh, quantitative uh, calibrations. So to do this, we we tried to predict water content on our system. So we had X, which were the the drying uh, the spectra during drying, and Y, which was the water content. So this is uh, the way today uh, we would actually uh, try to predict the water content. Then we did EMSC additive. So we only remove the additive effects. Then complete is really both additive effects and multiplicative effects. So we remove those fast length differences. And finally, what we actually proposed was to remove the additive effects, then we do a log-log transform of both X and Y, and look at what uh, we have. So because thanks to the log, we linearize the relationship. And what we can see, so here is the RMSC, uh, RMSCC of water content, uh, depending on the, the substrate, the number of latent variables. And even with one latent uh, variable, uh, we have a, a better model, a more simple model, which means that it's uh, more robust. And, uh, and so um, what we see here is that the log transform could actually provide, using this knowledge that we have, could allow uh, building a, uh, much uh, simpler and better models. But of course, what we can see is that we, we need to be able to remove those additive effects. And that's, in our system, we had our dry spectra, so we knew how to remove them, but it can be uh, much complex uh, for other systems. Uh, so the main conclusions of the three former studies I've presented is that the global linear models were uh, not reliable. The strategy one model for everyone, if we use uh, uh, linear algebra, it doesn't uh, fit. The analysis of water effects, so we, we, we see that we have a clear nonlinearity, which is depending both on moisture content uh, and the substrate type. And the scattering modifications can be modeled by a simple power law uh, related to passing differences. So from this, we wanted to investigate the possibility of uh, building local models in order to simplify our problem and having uh, a given number of substrates at a given, uh, within a, a given moisture content range and try to see if uh, we can uh, better uh, uh, build models. So this is my far, fourth uh, study I'd like to present. Um, so there's a, the, the, the aim was to find a, a a group of same substrates which had an homogeneous, uh, 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 which are influenced homogeneously by uh, water effects. So we looked at the principal components, uh, the first principal component, and we actually identified a group of 37 substrates, which indeed uh, followed 
this uh, power law that we had uh, validated on our aluminum paper pallets. Uh, so this is the R squared that are obtained, more than 0 0.5 for all of those samples. Uh, and so we said, okay, let's use those substrates and try to build a model since the water effects are more simple to evaluate. Still, there's the, the nonlinear relationship, but at least it's uh, similar. So we build the model on this local group by really uh, uh, using all those substrates and uh, during the drying and trying to predict the BMP. And what we obtain, in fact, is a, a, a bad uh, RMCP of uh, 90. But most importantly, still the R squared is very low. So we still are not able to build a model, even if we uh, uh, had homo substrates, which uh, at least from what we see are similarly have a similar um, water effect. So the local model still does not provide satisfactory results. So one of the, the then the following question is, uh, can this power law relationship, is it because it's not well modeled by the PLS? which would mean that we should investigate uh, nonlinear methods to take into account this, uh, this uh, nonlinear relationship. Or more simply, is it because the biochemical footprint is hidden of the, all the substrates are hidden by water, uh, water absorption, which would mean that we need to actually reduce the moisture content range. So to do this, we, um, we actually try to investigate this on the same uh, local group of uh, samples, so the 37 samples, substrates. We, uh, we built models with uh, the full range of moisture content, uh, under 60%, under 40, and under 20. And you see that, of course, there's uh, more satisfactory results as, as, uh, as you remove the moisture uh, content range, re reduce the moisture content range. So to, to better, um, to better actually uh, identify the moisture content range uh, for uh, all the, the, the different uh, substrates, what we proposed was actually to use the MCLS uh, uh, to, to add the knowledge that we have on the scattering effects within the MCLS uh, framework in order to better uh, decompose our spectra and try to identify those moisture content ranges. So the principle is really you have the X, uh, so the, the trying uh, experiment. Um, and MCRLS is going to decompose into two matrices of uh, concentration C and, uh, and spectra S. And with an alternating B squares, you, you identify uh, S knowing C and X, and then uh, identify C knowing S and uh, X. And what's really great about this framework is that you, have, uh, you can add up uh, constraints based on the knowledge that you have on the, the system. So the spectra here, it's quite classical. We, we said that the spectra will never be uh, negative. So we added this constraint. And on the concentration profiles, we said that it wouldn't be negative. We said that there's a closure. So we need to have a, a sum to one of the concentrations. Uh, unimodality means that we have only one mode. So we only have uh, uh, quite simple evolutions of, uh, of uh, the different uh, spectral footprints. And finally, what's really uh, here new is to add this hard modeling constraint where we force one of the components to, to follow uh, a power law. So we did this here on uh, wheat chaff. So wheat chaff is really uh, uh, mostly uh, fibers. Um, and so this is the observed spectra that we obtained during, uh, during drying. Uh, and those are the, the spectra and the the concentration evolutions that we obtain. So we see that we have a very good uh, reconstruction uh, with a 1.89 of lack of fit. Um, but what's really interesting is when you look at the concentration uh, profiles, uh, you clearly see here nonlinearity up to over 60% uh, of moisture content. So in this case, for this substrate, we, we would actually uh, reduce there's, there's no point in building a model from 0 to 80. Uh, linear methods will not uh, be able to do this. So it would be much better to actually do a model between 0 and 60% and eventually 60 to 80. Uh, so it also allows to really identify the non-linearities that uh, could be due to measurements, but also uh, just to the, the, the phenomenon, the substrate specificity. So in terms of conclusions and perspectives, uh, regarding the first objective, which was to uh, develop a better understanding of moisture content effects on years 
And in particular, when it's applied to this poor, uh, huge diversity of organic materials. So we see that we have developed a new experimental setup that uh, could easily uh, enable us to analyze the water effects and build uh, correction strategies. We see that the moisture content effects were shown to be both physical and chemical, and that uh, we could relate the path length uh, differences due to moisture content differences directly with a simple power law. Um, so the second objective to find new ways of building local mod uh, models that are robust to moisture content effects. Um, we have shown that the global correction method we've uh, uh, tested uh, quite a lot, uh, they are insufficient due to the non-linearity of effect, that's very clear. And the second uh, result is that the local modeling is actually uh, the strategy that we, we, uh, we suggest and we think it holds the promises. So in terms of perspectives, uh, at least on the fundamental knowledge that we have on water effects, I think we should investigate the modified uh, year-long bear law that we proposed in more complex systems, and in particular when we have uh, how to deal when there's an absorption, a like, uh, clear absorption by sugar, by uh, uh, fat, uh, how to deal with those effects, how can they be decomposed, because uh, scattering and absorption are very uh, related, in fact. Uh, and so quite similarly, how to remove additive effects. Here we had a simple model where we could remove those effects very easily because we had the dry spectrum. But how can we do that on a substrate where we don't have those uh, dry spectrum? And the quantitative calibrations on wet samples, we want to develop more the knowledge-based uh, local approach that uh, with the help of NCRLS. Uh, we would like to evaluate, of course, nonlinear methods since we see that uh, the phenomena is nonlinear. Can those, can local PLS, SVM, uh, and up to uh, random forest or neural networks, can they deal with this linearity? You know that we are going to have issues probably, it's more a black box approach, so in terms of maintenance, it, will, uh, uh, it could bring issues, but um, we think it's worth uh, trying. And one of, uh, one of another perspectives could be to use the news measurements during drying as one predictor. So they, I know they, they some authors have done that by uh, heating a sample and taking spectra during heating. And of course, using this uh, kinetic, this evolution of spectra during uh, a process. So here it's, uh, it was heating, but here it would be drying, uh, could add up in the, in the it, uh, help to disentangle the different effects and uh, use this kinetic as a, uh, for prediction also. So th this is the use of NWA methods such as NPLS. Or others. Um, and now in terms of on-site and online applications, um, we think really the sample preparation and the measurement configuration will be uh, complementary strategies to reduce water effects. Um, uh, and we also should pursue the evaluation of, um, of low-cost and hand -hand spectrometers, so on wet substrates, because this was done during the PhD work on uh, dry freeze dried and ground uh, samples. So we see that still we, have, uh, we can use uh, handheld spectrometers on those samples, but on wet spectra, we still need to assess this. And with this, I think you, uh, if you want your attention, I'm happy to answer your questions. <laughs>